Hey, this is Jeff, and we need to talk. Last episode, we demonstrated why the one-dimensional model of political thought, the left-right spectrum, is obsolete and dangerously misleading. We introduced the two-dimensional model, with axes representing economic liberty and social liberty, and saw that real-world political movements don't stay on the traditional left-right line, but trend toward the southwest quadrant with less liberty of either type. Today I want to talk about my political philosophy, which can be approximated as the extreme northeast corner of the graph, at the point of maximum economic and social liberty. I call that philosophy nonarchy, and full disclosure, when I was doing research for this video I discovered that word has rare but documented use as far back as the 1980s, so while I did coin the term independently, I can't claim to be the first. The central premise of nonarchy, at least my version, is that forcing others to accept unfair treatment through the use or threat of violence is unethical and intolerable. Most people agree enthusiastically with that premise at first glance, but they get a bit uncomfortable with the conclusions that derive logically from there. So bear with me, we're going on a wild ride. Anyway, I say this is only an approximation because the model presupposes that the existence of a state is a necessity, while nonarchy doesn't. In principle, given the right circumstances, there is literally nothing a state can do for its people that the people couldn't do better and more fairly for themselves. In practice, those circumstances don't currently exist, so true nonarchy isn't currently feasible. But it's an aspirational ideal, even if some degree of pragmatism is required in the real world. But Jeff, you may be thinking, no state? Nonarchy sounds a lot like anarchy, both phonetically and in concept. Well, yes. For years I called myself an anarchist, until I realized that doesn't accurately represent my philosophy. One reason is semantic. The root archi means rulership. The prefix an means lacking or without. By common usage, an implies something that's unusual or abnormal in its absence. Anaerobic organisms exist without oxygen, which is weird. So anarchy is literally without rulership, but it implies that's an unnatural condition whereas the prefix non means the opposite of. So nonarchy is the opposite of rulership. It means self-determination. I think that's a condition most people want, but it's also a condition which those who enjoy ruling constantly seek to deny us. And that's why all governments, all political parties, eventually trend toward the southwest quadrant unless we the people take action to prevent it. There are, of course, a few common objections to going all the way to the northeast corner, so let's address those. First, anarchy is often used as a synonym for chaos. But that's nonsense. People cooperate voluntarily to accomplish great things all the time. There's no law that says the Red Cross has to exist, and the same is true for almost any private employer or charity. Agreeing voluntarily to observe a code of conduct and follow someone else's instructions to achieve a common goal is entirely different from having that forced on you by a government. And I use the word forced literally. The authority of all governments from the most brutal dictatorship to the most benign democracy is predicated on the ability to enforce their policies and instructions through the use of violence. Government is violence. To be governed is to be violated. Granted, the policies and instructions in a democracy tend to be less oppressive than in a dictatorship because they're determined by consensus, not the whim of a megalomaniac. But as long as 51% can impose their will on the other 49 by force, the potential for substantial injustice still exists. Even the United States, widely considered a bellwether of liberty, is stained by countless examples of oppression. Of course, the United States isn't a pure democracy. It's technically a republic, ruled not by popular majority, but by a few hundred oligarchs we elect to represent us. And those oligarchs have done, or at least enabled, some horrible things. The attempted genocide of Native Americans, slavery, denying women the right to vote for almost 150 years, Segregation, personal income tax, prohibition, the war on drugs, the USA Patriot Act, ongoing state-sponsored discrimination against LGBTQ people, the list goes on and on. Now, I am absolutely not anti-American. There are a lot of places where things are much, much worse, and not very many places where you can make a case that things on the whole are better. I'm just saying that representative democracy isn't the final word in liberty. Another common objection to anarchy is that it's more strongly associated with violence than governments are, at least in many people's minds. 
Well, anyone who claims to be an anarchist, but wants to bring down the government so they're free to force their will on others is, by definition, not an anarchist. That said, there are some true anarchists who believe the end justifies the means, and to serve the greater good of abolishing the state, violence is acceptable. And this, even more than the etymology of the terms, is probably the key difference between anarchists and non-archists. I'm not a pacifist, although there are many pacifists I admire, but I do believe the only fair use of violence is to prevent or resist unfair violence. So unlike some anarchists, as a non-archist, I believe terrorism or any intentional harm to innocence as a means to the same end is unacceptable. Finally, many have objected that in the absence of a state, people would do horrible things to each other. And they're right. Of course, people do horrible things to each other even when a state exists, so let's draw another graph. We'll plot the power of the state against the harm done to people. Now, there are two sources of harm. The harm the state does to people, and the harm people do to each other, which we'll represent as two separate lines. When the state has zero authority, that is, there is no state, it can do no harm. And I don't think anyone can deny that at the other end of the line, when the state has absolute authority, the harm it can do is almost unimaginable. Think Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union under Stalin. Those are obviously worst-case examples, and this is really more of a range, but I'll use the median line for simplicity. Conversely, the less authority the state has, the more harm people can do to each other. But even in the total absence of government, that harm is a small fraction of the harm authoritarian states can do. Individuals can murder, discriminate, and steal. But genocide, institutional slavery, and taxation require a state. And the harm people do to each other is also a range, based largely on population pressure and the ethical standards of the society, but we'll use the worst-case line to reflect the best-case argument in favor of a strong state. Now we'll add a third line that's the sum of the first two, the total harm done to people by the state and by each other. And it's immediately obvious that the sweet spot is a state with the minimum authority required to prevent the worst that people would do to each other, but without the authority to do significant harm to the people itself. That's the pragmatic compromise I mentioned at the beginning of the video. But bear in mind, this graph is biased in favor of statism. In a society with ample resources and high ethical standards, that point would shift even farther to the left, which is the aspirational goal of nonarchy. Well, I like to keep these videos fairly short, and this one's already running longer than usual. So next time we'll dig a little deeper into this graph, and finally talk about concrete steps we can take to reduce oppression and advance the cause of liberty. As always, feel free to like, share, and leave comments. And if you don't want to miss the conclusion of this mini-series, or you want to check out my alternative viewpoints on future topics, why don't you subscribe? And we'll talk again soon.